lot of you dream of making video games for a living. Last issue, we looked at how college courses in game development can help you get ready to join a team. This issue shows you another useful approach. It's hard to get into the video game industry, but this is a door that opens for more people than any other. It leads to the Quality Assurance or QA department, sometimes called TEST. It takes a lot of people to thoroughly test a game. That's why as many as one out of every three jobs in a development company can belong to a tester. PlayStation's headquarters often has over 200 testers at work. What do they do? Our test department consists of, you know, some of the best gamers out there. They know what makes a fun game. And so they, they use that expertise and that experience to really add to the products that they work on. They receive the title when it's in its early stages of development, basically when the game is first playable. Construct test plans to look for defects within the game. You know, any game can have 500 bugs for the complete title and go as high as 6,000. But what our QA analysts are really striving to do is put forth the best product and maintain Sony's high reputation of quality products. But our QA team doesn't just QA the titles for bugs, but they also try to make sure that the fun factor is there. They provide commentary and feedback on the title, which in turn, you know, really added to the fun gameplay of the title. I think one of the most unique aspects is that we see titles six to eight months before the general public sees them. We get to play them thoroughly. We get to test them thoroughly. We get to know all the secrets about the game. Games have gotten bigger and more complex in the past few years, and a number of them can now be played online. As a result, the QA department is developing new kinds of expertise. We're trying to take the concept of a street tester, somebody who comes, you know, just pounding and playing on the game, to somebody who really has a good technical grasp of how the game comes together. And so we're trying to challenge them and train them to basically become, in essence, a low-level engineer of QA. They're digging into the, the game itself. We are starting to work with the development kits, opening up the games and working with the development team to see coding, to see graphics, wireframes. It's very, it's exciting, it's challenging. If you don't love video games, then you need not apply. You get to think games 24-7, which is what something I do anyway. I mean, it's not like flipping burgers or anything. You get to see the new game and test it before anybody else get to. Take a game you don't like, now play each level 100 times on a different setting, switch controllers, and pull the memory card out and play it another 100 times. There, now you're a tester. You will be playing video games in and out all day, every day, over time, double time. Your life will become video games. Most of the things that are, that are tested is your patience. Bagel Fridays. Free bagels every Fridays if you get here early. Everything is about breaking the game. And you kind of turn, you look at the guy and you're like, my god, I can't believe they're paying us for this. I like breaking things and I like watching my coworker Jason do the bike dance. <laughs> you get to see things firsthand while they're being made. It's a really, really good opportunity for you to get your foot in the door. Anything from a lead tester to a producer, into uh, graphic design and a game design and a level design, it's, it's an amazing opportunity. My official title is Senior Producer of uh, the Multimedia Department, and our primary responsibilities are the demo discs that you find either in the kiosk at places like Toys R Us and Walmart. Um, our main project, though, is uh, what you're watching right now, which is the demo disc that gets packed in with the official PlayStation magazine. And you might even recognize a certain voice. Yeah, I do all the narration on the OPM DVD, as well as produce it. I went to work as a tester, and that's how I got my first real foot in the door. For usually working closely with the producers or the associate producers on different games, and you can see how a game really comes together. I'm a designer for Sony, and basically I will come up with the content of the game, uh, the actual design of the game, uh, what you're doing, what the story is. I actually started as a tester, and uh, I worked my way up through, through the ranks. I tended to work really close with the developers. I would ask a lot of questions. I was extremely enthusiastic. I really wanted to know what was going on, what was broken, how was it broken? And this tended to get me really close to the development team. Then one of the teams had asked, you know, hey, what do you think about coming down and being a designer on our team? I was like, yeah. Alvin Pedroso has done what many of his colleagues dream of doing, getting his idea for a game approved for production. It's Rise to Honor, the upcoming action combat title from Sony. Rise to Honor started from a conversation between myself and our director of product development. And I just said to her, this is the game I want to make. And 
After our initial conversation, she said, roll with it. And after about two months of really just going back and forth with different ideas and writing things up, we pitched it to our president and got it approved. Rise to Honor has gone from like just me working on this title to about 43 developers now. It was enormously valuable to be a tester. I think one of the biggest assets that I gained was how to communicate a vision and get people to rally around that vision. This is the door to the quality assurance department. For many, it's a way into the industry. For some, it leads on to a development team. And for a lucky few, it's a path that helps them have a game idea published. But for all, it's a chance to work in a field they really believe in. Somewhere a door like this one might be waiting for you. I love video games. <laughs> it's, it's a passion for me. Uh, if I'm not making games, I'm playing games. You know, when I was younger, my parents would always say to me, they're like, stop playing games, stop playing games, go outside, do something else. You know, now my parents are like, oh, my son makes video games. So they think it's all, all cool. Next issue, Dev 101, is a mini tutorial. You'll get to see the winning drawing from the PlayStation Underground's Make Your Own Character Contest. Then you can watch how that drawing gets turned into a working 3D game object. This summer's full of excitement with hot events brought to you by PlayStation 2. Whether you like punk rock or heavy metal, we've got the tour for you. Warp Tour 2003 will feature the best in extreme sports and bands like Newfound Glory, Bad Religion, Pennywise, and AFI. Look for the Warp Tour in a town near you. The Prince of Darkness is back again for Ozfest 2003, featuring Korn, Disturbed, Chevelle, and a slew of metal mayhem. Check out the Village of the Dam for the latest PlayStation 2 games. The biggest pop culture convention in the country, Comic-Con International, hits San Diego on July 17th through the 20th with the best in movies, comic books, toys, and of course, gaming. known of the existence of Castle Wolfenstein for some time. We've only recently heard reports from our Kreisau Circle contacts in the German resistance regarding bizarre occult rituals taking place there. Still doesn't add up. Well, that's why we sent our boys in there. Rated M for Mature.
far beneath the shifting sands of time. The battle has begun. And a hero has been born. He is brave. He is powerful. He is a whole new kind of hero. for an immortal adventure. Sphinx and the Shadow of Set. Tormented scientist grappling with his own chemistry and destiny, betrayed by his most trusted advisor mentor, and transmuted into a monster that appears when rage can't be controlled. There's major damage ahead when Dr. Bruce Banner becomes the Hulk. The Hulk is an incredible character uh, for, for a video game because he can do so much. He's so dynamic. It's such an appealing uh, character that's known to everybody. You get the idea of the game in one word, Hulk. Now, if I said Hulk to anyone, even my mother, she'd know what's going to be in this game. You put the pad in someone's hand and they know what sort of action they're going to do. 
This is the story of a game spawned from the creative layer of radical entertainment at its not-so-secret location in Vancouver, British Columbia. When the folks at Universal Vivendi wanted to create the Hulk video game, they knew that it was time to get radical. Rather than simply repeat the plot of the movie in a video game, the story of the Hulk takes place a year after the movie ends. We were allowed the freedom to create this extension to the universe and give people more of that Hulk experience. One thing that's really important for the Hulk game is to capture the, the soul of the Hulk, the, the feeling of being that character and living in the same world as the movie and the comics do, and capturing that feeling of a cursed man who's on his quest to try and find a cure. So while our scientist battles for his very soul, the game's creators work diligently to retain the style and feel of the original Marvel comic while also reflecting some of the new movie's themes. The visual style of the game is all about combining the comic book world and the movie world. We've chosen to use what we call a cell shading approach to rendering the characters in the worlds so that you get this feel that the game is a living comic book. Cell shade style is taking uh, environments or characters uh, and not giving that realistic edge, a little bit more of a comic edge where lines are very crisp. Defined lines between shadow and highlights on the character will stand out a lot better, like something that you would see in a comic book is very graphic. The time has come to enter this nebulous realm where you'll learn to turn your angst into action. Caution, you may experience symptoms of a split personality, but that actually works to your advantage. The Hulk actually is a game that combines a couple of different genres. The gameplay features Banner Stealth and Hulk Destruction. Now, Banner has limited abilities. He's only a scientist, and he will use all his knowledge and abilities to help the player avoid being caught. As Hulk, you'll have tremendous power to annihilate any enemies who come before you, and there will be plenty of them. Well, we have a lot of characters in our game from the comic world of the Hulk and from the movie as well. And some of the big bad guys, for example, are Professor Crawford, who's the mentor of Bruce Banner, who betrays him at the beginning of the game. We also have General Riker, who's an army guy who's gone crazy and is after the essence of the Hulk for purposes of evil. There's Half-Life, Madman, Flux, Ravage, and there's the leader, who's the uber boss, the, the big bad guy for the whole game. You can unleash the Hulk's anger with at least 45 different moves and combos. Try using objects around you, throw a car, use a signpost as a club, punch back the enemy's weapons. Don't assume anything in the world is bolted down, because it's not. You can go and grab anything and use it as a weapon, and you can take out more enemies faster. It's incredible. When his rage meter maxes out, he can pull off amazing moves that can take out 10 enemies at once. It reaches this fever pitch where you're just so immersed in this game, you sort of bond with the controller and the game and you become the Hulk. It's, it's pretty cool. Also cool is the collaboration process that draws from the film and the comics to create a dynamic video game. We were granted really early access to the script and to digital images from the movie, from the special effects, and we were also given access to Eric Bana, who plays the lead character, Bruce Banner, in the movie. And he was able to do all the voice acting for the game during the shooting of the movie, so he was totally in character. My entire life, infected by this disease, I'm going after the cure. And we also have this huge catalog of Marvel material that's been going on since the 60s, featuring this character setting his style, how he moves, what he does, what his abilities are and we brought both of those together and created a look which establishes a new look for the video game. It's more than just a look in the history. It tells the story of a reluctant hero, and like Frankenstein and the Hunchback of Notre Dame before him, the misunderstood monster that is the Hulk. The thing I always really liked about the Hulk, which really separated from just about every other character out there, is he's an unwilling hero. He's hanging out, looking for crime, and trying to solve them. He's got this affliction that he's trying to cure himself from, yet he's got this amazing power that none of us have. And like a lot of superheroes in the Marvel Universe, he's often reluctantly using this amazing power to save the world or for the forces of good. Banner and Hulk are good guys. Yeah, good guys that have to do some pretty badass things to save us, themselves, and the rest of the world. There is evil everywhere. It lives among us, hidden under the mask of the night and shadow. This summer, you will be imbued with the power to fight.
as Interplay Entertainment and High Voltage Software proudly unleash White Wolf's haunting pen and paper game, Hunter the Reckoning, to the PlayStation 2 computer entertainment system. With entirely new gameplay, weapons, and characters, Hunter the Reckoning Wayward will deliver non-stop action and horror to the PlayStation 2 computer entertainment system. And now, we continue our journey into the world of darkness and take you behind the scenes for part two of the making of Hunter the Reckoning Wayward. Hunter Wayward features five characters. First is Joshua, named for the game. He's a wayward, paramilitary, psychotic, big, do not cross paths with this guy. Next character, we have Cassandra. She's a young raver girl, John Woo style fighting martial artist. She's really the fast character in the group. Then we have Father Esteban Cortez. He's the magically inclined character. Not as fast as the others, but his magic more than makes up for that. Then we have Deuce, big hulking biker. He's really the, the strong guy of the group. Takes out lots of monsters with the swing. Finally, we have Samantha, who's the balance character. She's an ex-cop, great with her pistol, loves using her katana. Hunter Wayward differs uh, vastly from the original. It's not a linear gameplay at all anymore. There's a hub system so you can select whichever level you want to play. Uh, there's a way to change characters throughout all the different levels. You can play different characters in different levels where you feel it's appropriate. If you need a faster character to complete the goals in one mission, you can choose a faster character. If you need a slower, more powerful tank battle character, uh, you can select them once you've encountered the mission once, go back and do it the way it was uh, it was meant to be in your eyes. Uh, play it out as harshly as you want or as sneakily as you want. It's really far more open than the first title was. Some of the new weapons and abilities. All the hunters now have an area of effect edge uh, that some of them are pretty spectacular actually. Um, that's one of the new things that we wanted to make sure we put in the game. The new weapons. There's a chain gun in the game. We've got grenade launcher, that actually has pretty good bounce physics. We have uh, flare guns, chainsaws, axes, swords, you name it, we've got it. With Wayward, uh, continuing our goal of trying to make a game that was better than the first one, we're really working on expanding the music. You know, we've got better sound effects, we're gonna have the Dolby Pro Logic 2 support, and in addition, we've also went out, we've got these big bands uh, from major record labels, and we're going to insert them into the game to better enhance and make them a more entertaining experience. We're going to do that by adding music videos and music tracks that you can listen to and just give an overall better package for the music and the whole game in general. The success of the Medal of Honor series has been built on its amazing accuracy in capturing the feeling of combat in World War II. For the latest game in the series, Medal of Honor, Rising Sun, the player fights his way through the Pacific Theater as Marine Corporal Joseph Griffin. To ensure accuracy and compelling gameplay, the team from EA Los Angeles went to the ends of the earth to visit the sites of some of the most infamous locations of the war. These included the bridge over the River Kauai, Guadalcanal, Singapore, and Pearl Harbor. There was a team of six of us, pretty much a representative from each of the various departments that spent about three weeks traveling through almost every location that's in this game and actually interviewed people, went to museums, tried to collect as much data and information as we could so we can make the game authentic. Eighteen days of grueling hell. <laughs> It was one of the, the, the hardest trips I've ever been on in my life. One of the most compelling levels in the game has Corporal Griffin trying to destroy the infamous bridge over the River Kwai by derailing a train traveling the span. There the team discovered that the bridge was not exactly what they expected. We started in Thailand and we went out to Kanchanaburi, which is where the actual bridge over the River Kwai is. And we got a lot of not only good physical reference, but being there really gives you a sense of why these things are important. Everyone has seen the movie, and if you see the movie, it looks like it's this massive bridge that spans this massive river. And it's just not the case. The bridge is tiny. There are instances where we're trying to walk along on the bridge and you have to literally 
move over to the right hand side to let a couple people pass you, then move back over into the middle and walk. So it's this really, really narrow bridge to the point where we were almost scared of falling off of it in certain places. So it's just kind of put everything back in perspective for us when we were there. During the war, Marines on the island of Guadalcanal were constantly bombarded by gun emplacements, which they named Pistol Pete. In the level by the same name, the player must destroy them in order to lead the assault on Henderson Field. Capturing the look, feel, and sound of this environment was very important to the team. For me personally, just kind of stepping back from the crowd and walking through the island and recording stuff was really surreal. And you're in an environment where the insects are so loud that you can barely hear your feet hit crunchy dirt or grass. So we will make the sounds as real as possible and we will add in everything from wind blowing and tree fronds blowing in your face to grass blowing and that's literally how it was when we were in Guadalcanal. Totally different from anything else that I'd ever experienced recording wise. Those were definitely the most harrowing of jungles that we went through. It looked like it must have looked back during World War II. Tall grasses as tall as a man's head, we were trekking through that. Mud all over the place, it rained on us. There were instances where we were walking along a path and one of our guides would tell us, be sure when you're walking around, to look on the ground. If there's open ground, you're sure to find something. We went through and actually got to discover sites that were still there, that still had live rounds, some that actually still had bones in them. And then we crested a hill and came up on a foxhole that they had dug out the day before for us. And there were probably about 25 live mortar rounds in this pit that we were able to just handle, you know, pick up and look at. They were still live. And they were in this beautiful, pristine setting that had been the location for a, a huge battle about 60 years ago. We had the most gorgeous cloud configurations with light streaming down. It was almost as if you could have imagined a host of angels coming down out of the clouds. And yet, we're trying to imagine conducting warfare on this beautiful, beautiful paradise setting. While on Guadalcanal, the team discovered that some of their designs had to be revised to match the actual scenery, including the placement of Pistol Pete. We were visiting this field that they had littered hunks of airplanes and tanks and all the stuff that had been scattered around they kind of put in one mini field in the jungle. And while we were there looking around, we looked off in the distance and there was this nice rolling green hill. And Chris Cross, the lead designer of the game, he pulled me aside and said, well, okay, right there, that's Pistol Pete, that hill. And our initial concepts and initial storyboarding of that level, it had shown the Pistol Pete Mountains as being very rocky, not very much vegetation on it whatsoever, and it turns out that that doesn't exist in Guadalcanal. So that right there is a one-to-one -one comparison of what's going in the game. One of the main goals of Medal of Honor Rising Sun is to find Yamashita's gold. And in Singapore, the player will need to use stealth to find crucial information leading to its capture. We turned and looked to the side at the gutter system they had there. And, you know, it was destroyed and it had a, a unique feel to what you would imagine with a gutter system. And Chris and I just started talking. We're like, hey, you know, that would be really cool to incorporate into the game, of like a stealth area or some place you had to sneak into or hide in. I actually told Dan, our historical advisor, hey, go jump in that. I want to get reference for how low you can go. Can you crawl through it? You know, how far can we go around in this thing? And instantly sparked. Okay, that's a great stealth point. And we had civilians just walking by and just looking at it, just thinking, what a bunch of idiots crawling around in our sewer system, you know? But we definitely did revise some of our gameplay based off of what we saw there. Just like in past installments of the Medal of Honor series, Rising Sun starts off at the frenetic beginning. The team's final destination is the spot of the game's beginning, and where in 1941 the United States was thrust into war. 
we went to Pearl Harbor and we made contact with some people from the Navy Public Affairs Office and they got us access to Ford Island, which is where the movie Pearl Harbor was shot. It was one of the places that were attacked during the invasion of World War II on December 7th. There was actually places on the asphalt on Ford Island where there were bullet strafing marks. We went onto the Missouri and being stationed on a ship is a lot different than you would think because you always see submarine movies and they feel like they're huge and you can move around and play ping pong and crap like that, but <laughs> it's really a tight environment and trying to get that sort of claustrophobic feel and, and imagining being trapped below decks with bombs going off right on top of you. That's absolutely important to try and get into the game, that paranoia of getting trapped inside a tin can. As you can see, accuracy is vital to the Medal of Honor team. Next month, we'll follow the team to the deserts of Arizona where they researched vintage weapons and were trained in World War II-style combat. Be sure to catch it!